Hello, I'm Dr. John Cruz, and today I'm going to be talking about inattentive ADHD. Does it really exist? So as usual, I'll start with the take home message. I'll be talking for probably 20, 25 minutes and open to questions and answers at the end. So my question, my, my title is purposely provocative. So yes, inattentive ADHD clearly exists. Why I'm talking about it in this way is I believe my own experience in the world is that there are many individuals who clearly display a large number of hyperactive and impulsive symptoms who are adamant that they only have inattentive ADHD. So I think we're neglecting this as an issue and that may be skewing some of our study results in terms of how we clump people, but I do think their inattentive ADHD exists. And we will look into the reasons I think some people may be more eager to be diagnosed with inattentive ADHD, or as some would say, I have ADD, I don't have ADHD. So we'll get into that. So I'm gonna start with one of the most vivid case examples, and it's sort of why I'm talking about this now. So I would say over the last 30 years, I have seen this phenomenon of people say, I only have inattentive ADHD, and yet I see them blurting things out, fidgeting excessively, telling tales of cutting people off or intruding in their space, of blurting things out of risk-taking impulsivity, and again, insisting on it. So one of the, I will not mention names, and this person from what I can tell is a lovely individual. I've had good, positive, supportive, encouraging email conversations with this person. But there's a woman who just released a book, she's 80 now, about inattentive ADHD and her history with inattentive ADHD and how she's worked for more than three decades to mo promote more attention to inattentive ADHD, particularly in women. And yet throughout her book, even though she identifies as having inattentive ADHD, she brings up examples of blurting things out, then cutting up people off, intruding on people, and of making impulsive decisions, often daredevil risk-taking behaviors that have led her into trouble, climbing on things in dangerous places when she was a kid, going out on dangerous expeditions as an adult, describes herself as almost constantly restless and yet is sort of presenting herself as a poster child for inattentive ADHD. So that to me is a curious phenomenon worth discussing in more detail. So I will launch into it, first of all, by how do we define inattentive ADHD? So inattentive ADHD used to be considered a subtype in the official DSM nomenclature. Now it's considered a presentation of ADHD. Um, so for ADHD, the person has to be displaying these symptoms before the age of 12. They have to be going on for more than a year. They have to be causing significant distress and dysfunction in multiple realms of the person's life. And they have to be um, not attributable to another condition, either physical or mental health condition. And for adults, so kids need six out of the nine inattentive symptoms of ADHD. So for the inattentive subtype or presentation, you have to have at least five as an adult of these inattentive symptoms and or traits. Um, and you should have minimal, the wording varies a little on who's writing the definition, you should have minimal to no hyperactive or impulsive traits. So the nine inattentive ADHD traits in DSM-5 are not paying attention to details and making inadvertent mistakes because of that, having trouble sustaining attention, number two, not listening when you're spoken directly to, number three, having poor follow through, number four, um, number five, having trouble organizing tasks, number six, resisting or um, not engaging in tasks that require sustained mental attention, number seven, losing things frequently, number eight, being distracted readily, and number nine, being forgetful in everyday activities. And again, these have to be excessive, they have to be persistent, they have to be affecting you most of the time, and the comparison group is your age group and often cultural group as well as comparison, that you have to be doing it excessively comparing to those. 
So one of the things in factor analyses, when we try to look at a um, health condition, including mental health condition, and try to figure out are there certain traits that jump together or stick together? Um, so again, we have nine inattentive traits. There's also for people with other forms of ADHD, there's nine impulsive and hyperactive traits. So factor analysis looks at whether certain clusters of symptoms run together and doing factor analysis of people who have ADHD using modern questionnaire symptom checklists showed that there are, depending on the study type, four different domains or clusters of symptoms or factors that tend to run show up. So one is there does seem to be genuinely an inattentive um, factor that comes out. There does seem to be a hyperactive factor. There does seem to be an impulsive factor. There does seem to be a, the fourth is an emotional dysregulation factor that is not addressed at all in DSM-5. And also deviating or expanding somewhat from the DSM-5 diagnoses, there's a number of what we call executive function deficits. Some of those are included in the inattentive symptoms, but there's a lot that aren't. So some of the factor analyses focus on um, finding, so, so there's at least other executive functions tend to closely cluster with the inattentive ones. So, so that includes wasting time, troubles having planning, troubles having self-discipline or identifying as you can't discipline or control yourself, having troubles prioritizing tasks, um, having troubles with either sequential tasks, things you need to do in a stepwise fashion, or keeping track of multiple tasks at the same time, um, being easily bored, needing a deadline to get things done, having trouble completing things on time, and picking up the details of a project and not getting the overall gist or idea of what's going on. So those are all executive function deficits or issues that tend to cluster tightly within a tent of domain. And what most of the research to date has found is that there is a group of individuals with ADHD who primarily have inattentive symptoms or this inattentive domain in none of the other domains. There's a very small group that has hyperactive and hyperactive impulsive traits, but don't have any inattentive ones. And then there's another sizable group that has what we call the combined type that has both inattentive and hyperactive impulsive and emotional dysregulation traits together. Um, so there is increasing evidence that there are different entities here, whether inattentive ADHD should be broken out and considered its own separate condition. Um, there's some evidence to support that. I'm gonna go into in a minute some differences separate from just the, the symptom cluster list, because clearly that would be circular saying that, you know, it's defined in terms of the symptom cluster list, but are we seeing other differences among these groups of people with different forms of ADHD? Um, so looking at what some of these differences have been found is one, most studies find that people with purely inattentive ADHD are identified at a later age. Um, and the common claim, and I, this makes perfect sense to me, is that the rambunctious, hyperactive kid running around the classroom is going to get his classmates' attention and the teacher's attention and the parents' attention at home much more quickly than the, and this is a kid who is sitting at home daydreaming and not completing his homework, but not causing a problem for others. So later age fairly consistently shows up in the inattentive, whether that's really the, that the symptoms are there at the starting at the same age and they're only detected or problematic later, or whether it's possible from the data that it's just that for most kids who have an inattentive type, it doesn't present until later. We don't have hard data to support one hypothesis over the other. There does seem in many studies to be a preponderance. Women seem to be overrepresented in that inattentive form of ADHD, although there have been a number of studies in the last decade that failed to find that, that some even found the opposite, that boys were overrepresented. Um, there's a number of, a few handful of studies looking at whether 
genes which were identified as having some association with ADHD were more likely in an attentive versus a combined type. And so far, no distinction there on specific genes has been found. I have not seen, there may be, but I haven't seen it, a genome-wide association study looking at whether it's the same cluster of hundreds, if not thousands of genes that increase the propensity for inattentive ADHD compared to hyperactive ADHD. There are also a number of studies looking at medication and other B treatments. And in terms of what people respond to, there does not seem to be a demonstrably shown difference in terms of medications or other treatments. There's a few studies which suggest that maybe purely inattentive type is less likely to respond overall or more likely to persist in the face of treatment. Um, and there's a little bit of evidence, although there's been some conflict and conflicting studies, and it depends a lot on what test you're asking, the task you're asking the kids or adults to do. But in terms of brain differences um, and the gross simplification is for combined type, there seem to be more um, identification of problems in the occipital cortex at the back of the brain, whereas with the inattentive type, maybe that is more likely to show up with frontal, temporal, parietal problems. Again, there's overlap. There's a lot of conflict. And in terms of other social interactions, other, so conduct disorders, uh, oppositional disorders, sort of violently acting out, rebelling, causing problems is more associated with combined type ADHD than inattentive ADHD. And um, in terms of social interactions, both groups have been found compared to kids without ADHD to have social interactions, but with the inattentive ADHD, it tends to be problems of isolation and avoiding contact with others versus the kids with hyperactive and or combined type ADHD causing social conflict by intruding on other space. Um, and in terms of comorbidities, again, there is some uh, significant lack of consistency, but some evidence that depression and anxiety, what we call internalizing disorders, tend to follow more closely or attach more closely with inattentive ADHD. And substance abuse disorders tend to more closely attach to combined type, because particularly impulsivity seems to be a risk factor for substance abuse, but so does inattentive. So one of the most frequently cited statistics was a meta-analysis. It's more than a decade old now. And what's frequently cited is this is these are the numbers among those with ADHD. Among kids with ADHD, kids is preschool age, about 23%. So one out of four, one out of five have inattentive type. But if you look at grade school, it's almost 45% have inattentive type. If you look at adolescence in high school, it's 72% of those who have ADHD have an inattentive type. And those are the numbers that I've seen quoted over and over again. They sort of ignore that in that same meta-analysis, you know, you'd think numbers are progressively increasing as you get older, but and among adults, it dropped down to 40%, 47%. So about half, that still made it the most common type. So the purely hyperactive type with no inattentive is, is a small minority everywhere. So is the combined type with the whole host of symptoms versus the inattentive type. Also say there's overlapping definitions. So Russell Barkley and a few others have promoted the concept of a condition called slow cognitive tempo. I think there's good evidence that that exists, but how often that is blurred or mixed in among the inattentive type or whether that's a purer form of the inattentive type. There's a lot of lack of clarity there. Um, so the interesting thing, again, with those numbers overall, part of the reason is that among those kids, grade school and adolescence, about 10% of the population there in, any, in those that analysis 10% of the total population had ADHD, whereas among the adult group, it's only 5%. So put in a different way, across every single age group, about 2.5, 2.5% of people have inattentive ADHD. But as you get older, 
we see a disappearance in people having hyperactive and um, hyperactive impulsive ADHD or combined type ADHD. So it's a dropping away or a disappearance of those and a persistence of those with inattentive ADHD. Now, one simplistic explanation for a substantial chunk of this, which doesn't seem to be that seriously addressed, but I think part of it is clearly there, is that among is that our criteria were written in terms of children. Um, they were somewhat adapted or modified to include adults. Um, but I think it's harder for many of us to assert. So, so if a kid is racing around the classroom, that's clearly hyperactive, hyperactive. If you watch the Republican debates or a certain past president who at every photo op, at every group of leaders of different countries, who's the one walking around, not sitting in his place. I mean, clearly that's a sign of hyperactivity again. I, I, again, I think we are minimizing or neglecting both as observers, both as parents, teachers, partners, friends, but also self-reporting as individuals, whether things like hyperactivity and failing to use the appropriate age appropriate matched comparison group. So again, I see a lot of people with ADHD who say I only have an ADHD and then in the group, I see them cutting other people off and blurting things out. and behaving in a way that I would say is clearly combined type. So what I see, and again, it's a smaller segment of the world than any mega study or analysis, but I see combined type ADHD much more than I see inattentive type. Could it be that I'm missing inattentive type? It could be, but given that I pick up ADHD overall in lots of situations where others fail to diagnose it earlier and most of the time the diagnosis seems resonant with the individuals and helps explain their life. I think it's, I'm not missing it that much. <coughs> so I think part of what's going on is that there's stigma still against ADHD and even within the ADHD field that there is greater stigma towards hyperactive impulsive symptomatology than in terms of inattentive it. And I think there's a couple different dimensions that can be looked at. One is that problems of inattention are more often looks like crimes of omission. I forgot to do this. I didn't turn in this on time. I didn't listen when you were talking to me. I missed the turn off on the road. Um, and people identify that, well, that's just who I am or the way I am, whereas the actions connected with impulsivity and hyperactivity are literally stepping on someone's toes, blurting something out when it was inappropriate, um, not waiting your turn in line, cutting people off. Those are things that are more often seen as acts of commission, that you actually actively did something that was disruptive. And more often we identify that as that is something that I did rather than something I am. And particularly among women, I think there is greater pressure to behave according to social norms. It's more okay for guys to be angry, to act out, to be impulsive, to do a whole host of things still in our society. And that women are more likely to be castigated, scolded, found abnormal for it. And therefore there is greater pressure on women to hide those behaviors or not acknowledge them, but to try to actively suppress them. And again, Although part of what's going on in ADHD is that these are tendencies or proclivities that your brain is prone to act in that direction, that doesn't mean there's no conscious control. You know, yes, people with ADHD overall are much more likely to be late for things, be tardy, be missing deadlines, missing appointment times, but there's you know a good percentage, I'd say at least 10 to 15% of the people I've worked with who for one reason or another are highly attuned to, I need to be on time, I don't wanna keep people waking, and they may be spending much more time than a neurotypical brain to be on time, but they do a pretty good job of being on time. Again, they've controlled that specific behavior because there were social or personal or psychological reasons for them to do so. Again, that's perfectly consistent with they really do have ADHD, they really do have an issue with this, 
but they've managed to find strategies to effectively cope for it. So the other aspects of, of why people with combined type are often confused or mixed with inattentive ADHD is I think sometimes the end result is the same. So the example I was thinking of, and there've been several reports of, you know, of people winding up in dangerous situations. So driving down a one-way road in a park in a winter snowy condition and driving to the end of the road and realizing your car gets stuck and your cell phone is out. Now, that could happen to anyone, but I think there's two very, so if you're inattentive, that could happen because you just weren't paying attention to the turnoff, you weren't reading the map, you were making mistakes like that, you didn't really know where you're going. You could also wind up though in exactly the same play from an impulsive um, hyperactive direction that, you know, you looked at the map and doesn't look really clear whether the road goes through or not, but you want to be there in an hour to meet up with grandpa and the relatives. So you're going to, I'm going to go, damn it, go ahead anyway. And it's probably going to go through because most roads, you know, I can't trust Google maps or something. So in both cases, you might wind up in a pretty bad situation. One though is caused by inattentiveness and one was caused by hyperactive, impulsive ADHD. But if all you learned about the event is someone wound up at the end of a dead end road 40 miles out and their battery died or their car got stuck and they weren't prepared for it, you wouldn't know and whether you'd assume or make the, which story you line you would fit, try to make fit to the story, <clears throat> would reflect more your biases than what was really going on. Um, the other <coughs> aspect why I think many people, again, with combined type ADHD wind up claiming they have ADHD, inattentive ADHD, is just one component of ADHD is poor monitoring of yourself and your own actions. I can recall a friend um, who I would often meet for a meal or coffee shop, and when she was talking, <clears throat> about things she talked a lot she talked excessively but when she was talking about things that were particularly embarrassing or difficult or frustrating for her she got louder and louder and louder completely no awareness of it but the things that were most embarrassing difficult for her she was you know people were literally turning heads and it was clear there was absolutely no awareness of that so if you have less awareness of when you are making I, you know, impulsive, hyperactive behaving in this way, then you are going to underreport it in the survey. So again, the bottom line is I do think inattentive ADHD really exists. I do think there are people who have primarily inattentive form and very little of the other emotional dysregulation, hyperactivity, impulsivity, but I do think there are still a substantial percentage of people with combined ADHD who are considering themselves and maybe on self-reports or even others are mistakenly being identified. And part of identifying this phenomenon is important because if we really think these are two separate conditions, um, if you're including people in the wrong group when you're doing a genetic analysis or you're doing neuropsychological testing, that's going to dampen any results you may find. So. That's about all I have to say today. Um, next week's topic is weight gain, stimulants, and ADHD. And I do see there's a bunch of questions, so I'll try to answer them. So Ken's question is, are there medications that treat the impulsivity and emotional lability more effectively than the attentive aspects of ADHD? So again, the studies I was looking at most Specifically here, we're looking again at whether there were medication differences in purely inattentive versus combined type. Again, so most of those combined type people do have some attention deficits as well. And overall, there is a failure to find any big distinctions. That doesn't mean there might not be some. Um, there may not, or, or that separate from classifying people are the inattentive symptoms within an individual more responsive to one set of medication than another. 
I know that there are drug companies and there are certainly professionals who strongly focus that this set of symptoms are dopamine dependent and these are norepinephrine or these are frontal brain and these are back of your brain issues. And what I see in real life, I, I haven't seen clear cut differences for most people in terms of those symptom dimensions. That would be my answer. So YouTube playlist says UK has a shortage of Vyvanse. I take 30 milligrams. Um, so he's comparing different forms. So the Vyvanse is a slow acting. Um, I'm not as familiar with Amphex, uh, what its delayed mechanism may be. He says one is slow acting, the other fast acting. I'm scared of the impact to me, and I'm not sure if the fear. So he wants to know what he can do to slow down the effects of the immediate release. I mean, there's some limited data that some amphetamine use, absorption may be slowed by highly acidic diets or higher fat diets. There's other studies that suggest that would be minimal. Um, Yeah, other, I, I don't know ways of slowing down an immediate release form. It's going to get into your body when it, you're, as it's absorbed, and it's going to go through the blood-brain barrier pretty quickly and get to those receptors in the brain. And an important point is that with stimulants, it's not just the total dosage people are taking. It's the that that's one factor in terms of the effect, but also how quickly it's getting onto on and off receptors. So the rate at which stimulants enter your brain is an important variable. So sorry, I don't have more direct help. Um, Leo, Bo Leo Boba Leo Boba asked, does the prevalence of smartphone addiction and digital media consumption have its changed the factors in which to diagnose hyperactive versus inattentive ADHD? So I would argue, yes, I haven't thought about this, so I'm going to be thinking out loud as I'm saying it. Again, I think there is so much, these devices are so powerfully addictive, so powerfully attention grabbing, and they're designed to do that, that many people, you know, who might have been racing around when they didn't have something. So I was, I was talking about this with, with the patient the other day. In the old days, my days, you know, if you're on public transportation, you might bring a book, you might bring a magazine, you had something to read. When you were done with that, it was done. If you forgot to bring this bulky thing, you had nothing to do, you were bored. In this day and age, most of the people, when I've ridden a bus or other public transportation, are transfixed by their device. These are people with ADHD or not. So I think that very potent attention grabbing device does have a way of suppressing some hyperactivity, um, it doesn't eliminate it. So some of those people are still the you know, ones with ADHD who may be tapping their feet or doing other things, but there's some evidence that, that some of the fidgeting is a way of helping focus attention. But if the device itself is compelling enough, there may be less need for a whole range of overtly gross body movement and minor fidgeting. So. I don't know rigorous research on that, but I would expect yes. Hello, Dennis. So Dennis says, Dr. Thomas Klein mentioned that opioid addiction is genetic while stimulant addiction is not. Is that true? I don't know of any direct study that would support that or why it would be true. I don't know evidence that refutes that. I mean, the, the same dopamine systems and frontal brain control, downward control, exerting control systems that are implicated in opioid addiction are implicated in stimulant addiction. Um, the same animal models seem to be relevant in both. So I, I'd have to look more specifically to what he might be citing. So I'm not, I'm not aware of the evidence. I'm also not pretending that I'm an expert on addiction, although I think I know a fair amount about it. 
So Ahmad Kajil, I'm sorry if I've mispronounced your name, says, does Femifaxine work for the ADHD symptoms? So yes, Effexor Venlafaxine does help with ADHD symptoms. It's a pretty lousy choice in my mind. So I use a lot of Cymbalta, Duloxetine. So both of these are dual acting norepinephrine and serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Most research, unlike if you listen to Donald Ehrman, suggests that serotonin reuptake has minimal effect on core ADHD symptoms. It can certainly work on concomitant depression, anxiety, social anxiety, OCD symptoms. Anyway, then the vaccine is pretty darn weak on norepinephrine reuptake. So until you get to higher doses, you're not getting a lot of it. If you're really trying to help with ADHD, it makes much more sense to be using duloxetine, which is fairly evenly balanced, or even going to nilmasopran, which is Sabella or Fetsima, um, which are more potent on the norepinephrine end. And there are studies on all three of those substances being clearly beneficial for ADHD. And one of my recent talks was on Stratera and the problems with it. And my conclusion is that Cymbalta is a, at least as good in the short run for treating ADHD as Stratera and much more tolerable and much more acceptable to most people. So another question. So I do have a talk in this on, on my YouTube channel on armadafinil, which is new vigil or the, the R stereo isomer of pro vigil modafinil. It clearly helps ADHD symptoms overall. I don't have the top of my mind whether it is more effective with inattentive versus hyperactive and impulsive. And the salient point that I recall, and it's a group at Brown University, I'm forgetting the names of the researchers. Their parsing of the studies suggests that armadafinil and modafinil are better at attacking the core symptoms of core executive function, inattentive symptoms of ADHD than the stimulants, which they think are having probably a more profound effect on motivation to take care of tasks or tackle tasks. So that's what I'll say there. So Ricky K says, has there been any studies on ADHD medications and gambling addiction? If they do stimulants make gambling addiction worse like other medications might? Yeah, I, I don't know of any study that formally tried to look at stimulants as a treatment or, I mean, if they thought it really was gonna make it worse, it would be pretty hard to get any approval for such a study. I mean, clearly people with ADHD are overrepresented among those who get into addictions, including gambling addictions. And I would interpret the body of studies of looking at ADHD is a risk factor for addictions. Stimulants, particularly Ritalin seem to, which has been more studied, seem to lower that increased risk. It doesn't eliminate it. So by that measure, the expectation would be that stimulants may make it less likely to develop a gambling addiction if you have ADHD. So YouTube playlists asked, um, Infexa again, sounds like it's so fast acting that it may be addictive, whereas Viavance is slow acting, so not addictive. So one is overall, and I, not checked it recently, but when I've tried to search extensively in the past, it's amazingly difficult to find studies as to what is the rate of addiction with kids taking Ritalin, with kids taking amphetamine, with kids taking immediate release versus extended release versus kids at different age groups. Are there gender differences? Are there, there's almost no good epidemiologic evidence. I mean, the numbers that get cited over and over again are, oh, maybe two to 4% of kids on stimulants, mostly Ritalin, wind up addicted to it. But most of it are, it's just really poorly done. And it would be amazingly difficult to look at differential rates with differential products. Clearly, the experts for years have contended that the immediate relief forms are more 
likely to feel rewarding and you're more likely to feel it and may it makes sense that they would be more prone to people developing addictions but there's very little rigorous data that i'm aware of proving that fact it makes sense it may well be true but very little to show it So Herman Musimbi um, said, why didn't ABT 894 sovinaclean go further? Was it related to nicotine addiction? I can't answer that. I can try looking it up, but there's lots and lots of reasons that drugs that look promising at early stages get abandoned. I mean, some is that they just fail to differentiate. So last week we were talking about Stratera, the hopes were it was actually going to be approved as an antidepressant. It didn't differentiate from the placebo group as strongly originally, and then they sought a market role for it for treating ADHD. And for years, it was, it was the first and only non stimulant used for treating ADHD. Interestingly enough, now finally, the FDA is close to approving other pure norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors for depression. Um, or getting back to modafinil again, there's good evidence modafinil is effective for treating ADHD. The only reason it's not being used for FDA approval was in the studies looking at kids with it. One kid developed a Stevens Johnson syndrome, which is a very potentially lethal, you know, it's very serious rash, it's a, where you get blister like skin rash and it's essentially the equivalent of third degree burns, your skin can slough off, you can die. Um, but we know some people develop this bad reaction to almost any drug that's been out there. There has not been a close association or a high relationship between modafinil and Stephen Johnson syndrome, but on the FDA approval panel, and again, this was a psychiatric drug, most of them were psychiatrists, the one dermatologist on that group said, we see this all the time. It's not a big deal. It's not been associated. Go ahead and approve it. The, the results look good. It works for ADHD. And it was a psychiatrist on the panel and said, oh my God, we're not used to dealing with medical complications. Uh, don't approve it. And the company decided it wasn't, you know, they were already making good money. They didn't need to get that additional approval. And particularly in the US, it's perfectly legal and I would say ethically acceptable to use a drug off-label for something that has not received FDA approval for if there's studies and research or personal even patient experience showing that it can work with that condition. So great questions, everyone. I will try to look up and find more information on the things I didn't know much about. I will hope you all stay healthy and happy during the coming week, I'll be back next Tuesday with weight gain and good night, good morning, wherever you are. Um, have a good week.